Welcome to our web exclusive. I'm Mike Montecalvo, along with Eyewitness News Analyst, Lieutenant General Reginald Centrakia. We will talk about some issues close to home, General. First, let's talk about uh, Libya and what's been going on there. We talked so much about the unrest in Egypt. Now it's shifted to Libya. Is there any similarities going on here, or Gaddafi is a little bit different? I think Gaddafi is different. Obviously, he has uh, demonstrated he'll continue to use brutal force against anyone that's protesting uh, to perhaps oust him. But I think the one of the most significant thing we need to keep in mind about Libya is that it is, in my opinion, probably very close and similar to Afghanistan. We have so many tribes within that area, and they don't have a central uh, point of uh, a common denominator, so to speak, with the exception of having Gaddafi been in power uh, for the past 40 years. So the cohesiveness within Libya really has been held together through a, uh, a, a tyrant and a regime that has not tolerated any kind of protesting, and it's been demonstrated in the last week or so. So therein lies the difference, and I think we're in to see the, the worst of it yet. Well, the eastern part of that country really is what supports uh, Gaddafi. Would they turn on him at all? I think so. I think you'll eventually see that uh, the, uh, the control he has and has had for the past uh, 40 years or thereabouts uh, really is dependent upon whether the tribes themselves have enough loyalty to him and his regime. But I think you're starting to see that uh, slowly uh, go away. And when that point uh, comes about that you'll see a, a dispersion of that loyalty, you'll eventually see him taken out perhaps of his own choosing by force. You know, it's hard to figure this out and read this out when you think about it. He has denied them their basic rights. He has cracked down harshly on people. He squandered the country's wealth, yet the tribes are completely loyal to him. How does that happen? Because they share in that uh, power. You know, as long as he has not, uh, I, I believe, as long as he has not placed his personal influence on those tribes and they've been allowed to do what they want to do within their own areas, they'll continue to tolerate him. And when there's someone that uh, wants to protest, that he has demonstrated that he'll use you know, brutal force against them. And the tribes obviously let that happen. When it gets to the point, if it does, uh, and it, it looks like it will, uh, he starts influencing that, that kind of brutal force against the tribes, they will certainly turn against him, and, and therein lies his demise. Well, if you look at it, too, he's never really trusted his army, even though he came from the army. He's kept that military weak. Did he do that to prevent any challenges I, against them? I, I think certainly. Uh, that has been uh, one of the main concerns he's, he's had over the years. He came from the military, uh, doesn't trust the military in general. Uh, I think he has controlled the military uh, over these years by having the right people who have been extremely loyal to him, and they share in the wealth of the country along with him, uh, so therefore he's been able to control the army. But in the last several days, uh, since the beginning of the protest, we've seen the, his regime start to fall apart, and the leadership in the army really doesn't have the control over it it used to have where we saw two pilots defect. Uh, that demonstrates to me that there's an unraveling of the discipline within the military itself. Well, you're talking about revolutionary committees and militias. This, it's going to come down to a numbers game between, you know, that faction and obviously the, uh, his military. I mean, there are 35,000 just in the Air Force alone. Will it be a numbers game in the end? Well, I think it'll be a numbers game insofar as who has the best weapon systems and who has the ability to uh, impact the greatest harm on whoever the, the loser might be. Um, but in the middle of all this, uh, the, the, uh, the common folk within the country, they're the ones that are protesting. And all of a sudden you'll see it start to uh, evolve into uh, this side and that side, and it will end in a brutal conflict. And I do believe that Gaddafi will eventually be uh, taken out. Well, it took less than 20 days for Hosni Mubarak to uh, leave Egypt. It's going to take longer, though, for uh, Muammar Gaddafi, I assume. And as much as uh, I can see, yes, uh, right now that seems to be the case. The difference with uh, Mubarak is that you saw some, some protesting, you saw some violence, but there was no involvement of the army against its own people. Therein lies the, the major difference between what we're seeing unfold in, in Libya versus uh, um, uh, Egypt you start to see more and more violence, and it will come to a point at one uh, sometime in the future, in the next several days perhaps, where we'll start to see that discipline further unravel, and the ability for the military uh, to fire on its own people will be the key question. Will it, they do it or not? I don't think they will. You know, the answer for Mubarak was maybe if we were talking about crimes against humanity. How about this time around? Do you see it? This one is a little bit different. This one's documented. I think it has much to do with uh, a demonstrated 
uh, a series of events that he has, in fact, uh, claimed credit for uh, all the way back to the uh, Lockerbie uh, bombing. And he has endorsed terrorist groups uh, from time to time and openly stated that from time to time. So I think he's built a case against himself over the last uh, several decades. Well, he took responsibility for it eventually, but now we're finding out from an ex-cabinet member this week that he actually ordered that hit. Now, if you know, now you're the United States and you know that, what's our next step? Our next step is to look to the United Nations and hopefully uh, come up with either sanctions uh, and possibly uh, bringing him to some kind of a, uh, a trial uh, based upon uh, what is best for the, the free world. Um, that may take place, it may not. And, I, and I, we're all getting off the subject. Uh, every time we see someone committing a, uh, a felony against humanity in an international world, it's very hard for the United States to execute the, or prosecute rather, uh, that individual or group of individuals without reverting back to some international forum. Now, he has vowed to fight with his last drop of blood. That's an actual quote, General. Is he saying that because he's afraid of all the scandals and when people find out how wealthy he actually is, that he's going to stay there until he dies? That could very well be. That's a way to uh, avoid all of the, uh, the stuff that he apparently would be faced with. Uh, and I think that would be uh, the case. Uh, he would go out fighting, and he'll go out, and perhaps uh, the way he'll go out is being killed. Would we ever get involved militarily to take I him out? I don't believe so. I don't believe we will. I still hold that back as far as uh, what it means for the area. I think if uh, the Suez Canal and the pipeline were compromised, we would go in because of necessity, because 40 percent of the world's oil comes out of that area. Now, only 2 percent comes out of Libya. It would hurt, but it wouldn't uh, cripple the entire economy of both Europe and the United States. Are you worried that he's got nothing to lose here and he could do just about anything? I, I think he feels that way. His son uh, recently had come to, him, come to his defense, so I think the only one that would have something to lose would be his son and his family. But he, I think he's resigned to the fact that if he's going to go out, it's going to be because someone will kill him. Well, we see a domino effect here. We've seen two leaders so far. You know, I'm thinking of Ahmadinejad and Gaddafi next. You will doubt, I think. We'll definitely can see the continuation of this, this uh, uh, effort to uh, obtain democracy. The concern is I'm not quite sure that the people who are um, feeling these protests and wanting democracy understand what the consequences are of what democracy is. We in the United States understand democracy to the best of our ability, and we don't have a true democracy. We have a republic, and we have trouble with that from time to time. But giving democracy as it's understood in the Mideast, I'm concerned that uh, something perhaps worse will come in its place rather than what they understand as democracy to be. Well, you're talking about democracy. We can j democracy, you can see what's going on in Wisconsin right now where the Democratic leaders just took off not to, Good point. <laughs> to take a vote here. Yeah, we've been in this business for a couple of hundred years, and we still have problems with understanding the whole uh, process. So when you, when you want democracy, uh, and some of our forefathers uh, warned us to say, you know, here it is, uh, try and keep it. And I think I'm uh, taking that out of context a little bit. But nevertheless, uh, if the people of the Middle East want democracy, they have to understand that it's more than just freedom that they're asking for. The, you need to have some kind of government. You need to have some kind of social discipline. And I'm not sure they understand the whole scenario of what democracy means. And therein lies the, the challenge that we all have. What's your take on uh, what's going on in Wisconsin? Is it union busting? I don't think so. I think we're all going to be faced with that sooner or later. You know, no one, he says the state is completely broke. Exactly. And Rhode Island isn't that far behind. When you start talking about unfunded uh, mandates and, and unfunded pension programs, at some point we will reach a point where there is no more money. So the decision is, what do you do? Do you continue to uh, escalate uh, unfunded uh, mandates on the people? Or do you come to some kind of compromise where you understand that there has to be something that represents the common worker, but the kind of power that the unions have, have gained over the last, uh, since the 1920s, have come completely out of context as to why they went in to begin with. It was originally designed for the environment that people worked in. It had very little to do with other benefits that have been taken, you know, forefront position in negotiations. And that has given us uh, really a uh, major concern as to whether we can continue to, uh, to support the commitments that were made even 15, 20 years ago. Well, the million-dollar question, General, is what is the compromise? The compromise is they've got to understand that they can't be asking for more and more and more on a, uh, a, 
a uh, complicated basis and escalating every single year because there's nothing that can guarantee that the revenues and this, the resources available to satisfy those things for you know, a generation down the road will continue. We have the same problem at the, at the federal level, too, with Social Security and other social programs. Can it be sustained? And right now, it doesn't look that way. And, John, before we were out of time, there seems to be a rift between the mm -hmm. Providence Police Department and Public Safety Commissioner and the Attorney General's office. It's over immigration. Stephen Perry says he doesn't want his officers to get into the immigration issue. Are you kind of surprised by I am his, a little uh, surprised comments? at that. Uh, you know, I know uh, Colonel Perry very well. I understand his, uh, his uh, strive is to ensure that the Providence Police have a good relationship with the people in Providence. On the other hand, I think he also understands that uh, uh, illegal Ill aliens in the state are hurting our economy, and there has to be some system in place to be able to identify them and, and uh, deal with them uh, correctly. And uh, everybody keeps circumventing the, the, uh, the main problem we have. There is no problem with immigration. It's legal immigration that we need to strive for. When illegal aliens come in, they need to be identified and need to be dealt with, and to include uh, all of the things that ICE uh, have to do. And I have no problem with understanding local police, state police, and every other law enforcement agency must be on the same sheet of music to ensure that we're not hurting our society as we apparently have been in this state specifically over the past bunch of years. So who wins the argument? Well, Martin think, or Perry? Well, I think right now Perry is working for Tavares, and Tavares uh, uh, has that philosophy. Uh, Kill Martin is subscribing to the uh, Safe Communities Program, which is somewhat divisive. But I think right now they'll continue to, to work as best they can this far apart. Okay. General Centracchio, as always, thank you very much. Good to be here. Thanks for watching.